A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one! This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Hey, look at that. We're back. Rebel Force Radio returns. Tanned, rested, ready. Back from our spring break. Hope you don't mind. We took a little time off, but you know how that is. It's never really time off. We're still uh, releasing things over the Patreon and some huge news. A lot of you have been asking about what Rebel Force Radio's plans are for Star Wars Celebration. We announced that. And we'll have uh, more details here uh, very, very shortly on the program. Uh, Before uh, I get any further, I just want to do a real quick shout out. I want to say thank you to Keith, who I ran into uh, while uh, doing a little video shoot on the day job. Uh, I'm standing there. I got the cameras. I got the lights on me. And um, we we, we sort of wrap up this quick little uh, video segment we were doing. And this guy comes up and uh, he was like the DP on the gig. And uh, he says... uh, uh, Jason and I'm like person he's like uh, and uh anyway he pulls out his phone and he shows me a photograph of me him and that other guy here at Rebel Forest Radio in Chicago Star Wars Celebration Chicago and he's like uh just been you know been a listener for a long time love RFR uh thanks for doing what you do match in chicago came out to skywalker rises in ohio and uh it was cool so thanks keith for making me look like a big shot you know Uh, it doesn't happen very often but what it does it's great um as i said it wasn't just me in that photo wasn't just keith it was also my good friend and yours from chicago jimmy mack hey jason hey star wars fans are you sure it wasn't puppet lando that was with you no definitely not (laughs) Definitely. No. Not. Well, uh, cheers, uh, actually, and happy St. Patrick's Day hey, uh, to you that. and yours. I have me a, a leftover Guinness from the uh, the big celebration there, and I have it in my Norse Legion Guinness. Cheers! Wow, pint it's mug. Beauty. Well, it's not a mug, pint glass. Look how good that looks. Boy, the that's nice. Kevin Lyle artwork on it, and a full pour of Guinness. Yeah. Uh, the Obi Wan Kenobi Guinness. Pint glass is available at NorseLegionStore.com. NorseLegionStore.com. And I suggest you get one. I love mine. I think that's and his I, number one seller of all the different, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, mashups and things that uh, Kevin's done. He's done a lot of great yeah. ones. But I think that yeah. was the one that, you know, people just mm-hmm. keep buying and buying and buying. And it's a great one. It's a great one. Yes. Officially licensed. And, um, only available at NorseLegionStore.com. I mean, look how good it looks when it's filled all the way with a Guinness. Yeah. It looks it's fabulous with the uh, Alec Guinness on there. Oh, more on Alec Guinness coming up later in the show. Oh. But uh, I uh, definitely have to say Solancha, and uh, I'm happy to be back here. Like you said, Jason, we were busy last week, even though we weren't doing the show. Um, so many people have been asking me. Are you guys going to do one of your famous Rebel Force Radio Star Wars Celebration kickoff bashes? I mean, we have a reputation, Jason. As, you? Uh, throwers of parties of the... Oh, that quality. reputation. Oh, okay. I, oh, <laughs> we I didn't know. Reputation. I didn't know which one but you we, were referring we, to. But yes, we do throw great parties. <laughs> <laughs> we have reputation as uh, guys who throw great parties. And I'm happy to make the announcement here on Rebel Force Radio that we're doing it again at Star Wars Celebration Anaheim coming up this May. I'd like to, ladies and gentlemen, announce to you the RFR Rooftop Bash Anaheim 2022. 
That's right. Once again, we're kicking off the big convention with a Wednesday evening event. And you won't want to miss this one. It's going to be on the rooftop of the uh, premier, actually, the, the premier rooftop venue of Anaheim called The Fifth. It's on top of the Grand Legacy Hotel at the park, right across the street from Disneyland and uh, super Look close to the place. Anaheim Convention Center. I Absolutely mean, just incredible. Beautiful. I mean, I, I cannot wait to pack this rooftop with Star Wars fans who uh, listen to Rebel Force Radio. And uh, we're just going to have a blast. Uh, the doors open at 6. You're going to get a live podcast at 7. And uh, then we're going to see... Disney fireworks, which are clearly visible from our venue. Uh, it's just right across the street, as I said. So we'll be able to see their nightly fireworks, of course, weather pending and other conditions, of course. But uh, we fully expect them to be on schedule. We will be celebrating the 45th anniversary of Star Wars because it's going to be May 25th. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot also, of people have that date on their calendar already, Jim, when you think about it with uh, Kenobi premiering that day. It's the anniversary right. of Star Wars, as you say. So we thought we'd make it easy on you. You can remember when the <laughs> yeah. big bash is. It's May 25th. It's going to be one of the biggest Star Wars days in recent memory. And uh, there's going to be complimentary food. We're working on the menu right now. We're also uh, developing a bunch of Star Wars-inspired cocktails that will be available at the Cash Bar. Uh, there'll be special guests, photo ops, Puppet Lando. We got to hear his review oh. of Kenobi, Puppet Lando's review. <laughs> and of course, uh, you guys will be there. And, and you all are the most incredible group of Star Wars super fans on the planet and in the universe. So uh, it happens Wednesday, May 25th. We want to see everyone there. We'll have access to the entire 300-person capacity rooftop. And uh, tickets are $75. They include admission to the five-hour event. We'll be going till 11 o'clock. Also includes the live podcast, the uh, excellent food, and uh, the view of the fireworks. Plus, me and Jason are going to be hanging out all the way up until the very last minute. Yeah, we got the whole event. place till 11 o'clock. Yeah. Pacific time. Uh, all the details are over at rebelforceradio.com. Check them out. There'll be a link to get your tickets. Uh, tickets are already on sale for Patreon members. It's a pre sale just for being a Patreon member. That's all tiers, by the way. So if you're a Patreon member and you haven't gotten over there, uh, check it out. And then uh, on March 26th, that's a Saturday, they're going to be going on sale to the general public. So everybody will be able to get tickets but right now just for patreon members and uh, there's some really fun artwork i love this our buddy chris amarin put this together for us he's got uh, a jedi in his robes looking over the uh, the rooftop cantina band playing fireworks in the background it's just great that's right jason so as he, uh, jason mentioned the patreon presale has been underway and uh God bless our Patreon supporters. They put a big dent into our available tickets. So whatever is left over will go on sale this Saturday. Tomorrow as this podcast goes live, Saturday, March 26th at 12 p.m. Eastern. You could find the links at rebelforceradio.com. We'll be posting it up on social media as well. But if you can't wait till tomorrow, jump on board our Patreon presale. It only takes a buck to get your foot in the door and you'll have access to tickets before they go on sale to the general public. So, like I said, the Patreon audience bought up a bunch of the tickets. So maybe uh, a little more than half will be available when this public sale goes live. And so you don't want to miss your opportunity. We fully expect this event to sell out. It is a 21 and over event, keep in mind. And uh, we want you guys all to be there and join us in Anaheim as we rock the roof um, at the 5th. And, and like I said, it's right down the street from the convention center, too. Yeah, so very don't convenient. Have to worry. Yes, I've seen some events happening associated with this convention, and they, they're a schlep to get there. <laughs> We're right down the street. I mean, you walk. You, you can walk there. Quick Uber, quick. Yeah, uh, But, yeah, get out and stretch your legs a little. If you're too 
tired. I mean, you won't even be tired because the convention hasn't even started yet. So you'll have fresh legs. Get out there and breathe. There's in. no excuse. The, the the Anaheim evening air as you walk over to party with us. So uh, doors open at 6, live podcast at 7, fireworks around 9.30-ish. And uh, we'll be partying until 11 o'clock. And we want you guys to party hard. We're going to be working on that blue milk recipe that uh, that made so many heads spin at our last live event in Was Chicago. That Reggie's? That was at a Lulu. A Lulu. A Lulu had the blue milk. So we're going to try to replicate that magic. Is that when Lyle got on the hook for all of those blue drinks? <laughs> he bought the whole room blue milk. Yeah, yeah. But he's yeah. just having fun. So, uh, and, and maybe uh, we can recreate that moment here in Anaheim. So, yeah, blue milk. Uh, maybe even try to copy some of those drinks they have over at Galaxy's Edge that cost you an arm or leg there and... We'll have it here at the uh, RFR Rooftop Bash. I don't know. I don't know if I can pull that off, but definitely there'll be some blue milk there. You can count on that. And it's going uh, to be better than the stuff Aunt Peru is pouring, let me tell you, because <laughs> it's going to be a little stronger. So um, that's all happening. It, yeah. it, it's, I'm so excited that we have this all locked down Wednesday, May 25th on the rooftop of the Grand Legacy at the park called the 5th. And uh, we have photos up at rebelforceradio.com, or uh, you can visit the fifth web, the fifth <laughs> web page, <laughs> and, and look at photos of the place. It's a spectacular venue, Jason. I really think this is going to be the best bash we've ever thrown. Oh yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, uh, first of all, we've got the experience. We've thrown a number of them uh, over the years, and but we've never had a venue like this. Not not no. on a rooftop. Not with the Disneyland, the iconic Disneyland fireworks uh, in the background. I mean, who knows? We might wrapping up that podcast, and boom, the fireworks are going off <laughs> as we're signing off. Imagine that. Imagine the sign off music with fireworks. It's gonna be great. And as you say, we're gonna be hanging out. Um, you know, so that's. You know, it's not like the, the podcast is over. It's like everybody go home, move along. No, the podcast no. It wraps up and we're going to be hanging out for a couple more hours. So it's going to be a lot yeah. of fun. And uh, I just can't. I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer. I have good news. Hey, check it out. He's, yeah. he's back. Oh, not me undies. He's back, Darth Vader, the Dark Lord of the Sith. Well, we knew it was going to happen. We knew that uh, he was going to appear in Kenobi, but it's now official, courtesy of Entertainment Weekly. Now, you know, they put out their big uh, Kenobi cover story, and um, we thought that, you know, that would be that would be it. We got the photos. We got the trailer. Uh, and we, we were talking about the whole Hayden Christensen Vader thing and that, well, you know, it's something that they probably want to save until closer to the premiere. But I'll be darned if uh, Entertainment Weekly didn't have this exclusive first look at Darth Vader in uh, the series in Kenobi. And when I saw this, the first thing that came to my mind, Jim, was hmm. comments that you've made in the past. You've said, look, I can tell when it's Hayden <laughs> in that armor. I know when yeah. it's Hayden. And so I see this, and of course the the caption on the on the photo that we're looking at right now um, is Hayden Christensen returning as Darth mm -hmm. Vader, and right. here you go. Now it's a great silhouette shot, not a lot of detail in this, but you can right. see the um, you know the iconic lights on the belt and on the chest piece. But what do you make of the shoulders, the proportion with the the helmet, yeah. all those things that you've said in the past that mm. uh, telegraph whether it's Hayden Christensen. Well, I think it looks pretty damn good, but I mean, again, as you said, Jason, this is more of a silhouette. This is not actually a detailed shot. Yeah. You can't make out really anything. Um, it's purely silhouette, except for the little lights on the chest box thingy and on the belt. Now, it looks great. To me, that looks accurate Vader. But the way I can always tell, or at least back in the Revenge of the Sith era, I could always tell it was Hayden in the suit was because the shoulder pads would jut out from the arm. And I think they mm. did that to give him a, a broader frame, broader shoulders, make him appear to look more like the Dave Prowse Darth Vader silhouette. And so that's that's cheating a little bit. But if, in fact, 
Hayden does show up in this series with those similar shoulder pads where it juts out from the arm to extend his frame, make it wider, then I'll be able to tell every time. Also, there's <laughs> something else about the way those 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 motorcycle pants would fit Hayden. They they seemed a little loosey goosey on him. Whereas with David Prowse, it seemed like he filled them in much more. So Loosey goosey motorcycle pants, <laughs> extended shoulder pads, and also the neck is a little more, a um, little more uh, squat. Is that the word I want to say? Squat. It just doesn't seem the neck is long enough. And mm. this is what I'm talking about. Revenge of the Sith, Darth Vader. Right. Is what I'm talking about. So uh, I don't know what kind of improvements they've done to the costume. Obviously, Hayden is 15 years older, 16 years older. So he may have bulked up even more because we saw Hayden bulk up between episode two and episode three. So Hayden himself might just be naturally bigger and might fill in the suit a little bit better. And there could be wardrobe improvements that have been incorporated into the suit. Hayden's a middle-aged guy now. You know, we all get that middle-aged spread. You know, maybe it's spread to the shoulders. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, he was a very, you know, he was a lean, especially, yeah, you know, yeah. he was lean. I mean, he did bulk up very thin. For, for Revenge of the Sith, but still had that sort of longer, you know, muscular look to him. I'll tell you something that kind of, this is a small detail. And they presented it in the making of Revenge of the Sith and throughout the buildup, they presented it as it was as if it was, you know, some kind of a remarkable achievement. But you remember they were making such a big deal about making the helmet more symmetrical? Yeah, and that's a mistake. <laughs> I agree. I think there was something much more organic about yeah. the um I don't you know, not the homemade, but you know, just it was a little bit more handmade. I don't know, natural or something. What's that? Handmade. Handmade. That's the word. Yeah. What they did is they made one half of the helmet. Yeah. And then they created a mirror image of that half and they glued it together. So it would be perfectly symmetrical. But I think it loses some of its character and charm. I agree. There is something almost that can apply expression with the Vader mask, depending on the angle it's shot at, the lighting it's seen with. And I think a lot of that stuff gets stripped away when you create the perfectly symmetrical mask. It yes. looks too much like a toy and not like the real thing. Yeah, um, it loses. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Um, it, it becomes almost sterile. And it yeah. doesn't have the same character. It's, it's a terrible. small detail, but, you know, we, we learned that with, um, you know, when they tried to improve things like the Yoda puppet. I mean, sometimes oh, newer yeah. is not better, but they no. think, well, we've got the technology. We can make this a lot better. And uh, one of the things about the Vader helmet was, you know, they were all being handmade and you know, it wasn't symmetrical. And it's like, well, yeah, it looked cool that way. <laughs> it really did. But uh, so anyway, according to, yeah. well, according to this picture. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing here is Vader emerging from his meditation chamber. Yeah. I was thinking more along the lines of back to tank because this looks very familiar to the environment we see in Vader's castle in Rogue One. Indeed. But you see the top where that beam of light is coming out. Mm -hmm. That sure looks like those teeth that yep. would close in, that jaw that would close in around Vader. So uh, it looks a little smaller because... Possibly he's walked a distance away from it, and uh, he goes in there and he he does his thing. I, I'd love to see Vader back in the meditation chamber. We only saw that happen in Empire Strikes Back. There was supposed to be a scene of him in the meditation chamber reaching out to Luke in Return of the Jedi, and you could see that in deleted scenes. But that's the only time we've ever seen the meditation chamber. So to me, that seems like a Darth Vader staple. And I like the idea of it coming back for this series. Big I do time, too. I, big time. You know, in the expanded universe, even I know in the expanded universe that that meditation chamber uh, was where Vader did a lot of his, I guess you call it spiritual work, metaphysical work, trying to heal himself, trying to come back from those gruesome injuries on, on Mustafar, uh, taking moments outside of the, you know, the uh, breathing apparatus that he was connected to, see how long he could yeah. sustain, 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, breathing naturally without that. So he was he was working on that sort of thing. Um, but in this Entertainment Weekly story, there are some quotes from Hayden Christensen, and um, I feel like this might be certainly one of the few, if not the the first, actual official quotes from Hayden Christensen about coming back to the role mm-hmm. as Vader. Um, so you know, they they say he's a little bit a little bit coy about things, and uh, he says, you know, I wish I could tell you more, but I'm sworn to secrecy. When asked about what kind of Vader we're going to see in Kenobi, uh, he says, we're going to see a very powerful Vader. We're going to see a very powerful Vader. That's my (laughs) Hayden. That's your Hayden. A pretty terrible one. (laughs) All right. Well, I mean, you know, 15 years makes a difference. We're going to see a very powerful Vader. And um, now the question is, if they're going to go and get Hayden Christensen to do Vader, which they didn't do for Rogue One, uh, and Vader was not seen unmasked in Rogue One. Does does that imply by having Hayden in the role? Does that imply we're going to see a um, a de unmasked or maybe that mm. that sort of what's become now kind of kind of icon- iconic cracked mask uh, Vader in mm. the actual show? How much Vader are we going to see? Hayden Christian says. Uh, I'm sorry, we're switching gears here. Gears here. This is. Uh, series writer Joby Harold, he says that Vader's shadow is cast across much of what we do, and the degree of his proximity to that shadow is something that we'll discover. But he is very much a part of the show emotionally for Obi Wan and possibly beyond that as well. And when I read that, Jim, I thought, whoa, I wonder if that there's a possibility that we might not be seeing literal Vader as much as we see the Vader that might be in Obi-Wan's head. Could he Ah. be seeing Vader around every corner as he's, you know, uh, going about the galaxy, whatever his mission is in the, Mm. uh, in this series. So, you know, is is Vader living rent free inside Obi-Wan's head? Um, you know, we'll find out, but he does say, this is Joby Harold, you know, it's part of the show emotionally. I'm so happy you brought up the idea that, we might see him with that cracked faceplate on the helmet, like as was in the Force Unleashed video game or in season two of Star Wars Rebels. Yeah. Where you just get a glimpse of his eye in there, some part of his face. I, I love that idea. I personally think we definitely will see him helmetless in the meditation chamber, weeping over the loss of Padme. No, I hope not. <laughs> I know I'm you're not like a fan that of idea. that. Yeah, you're not I'm a never fan like of that concept. The- Never the lovelorn, the lovelorn no. Vader. Yeah. No, I'm more a fan of him fully embracing the dark side persona and diving headfirst into it be- because that's the only way he can survive. He can't live with knowing that he killed the one and only love of his life. He can't live with that. So yeah. he has to bury that. And by burying that, he buries the entire Anakin Skywalker persona, his real self. He buries all of it. He doesn't even allow himself to look back in the past. Anakin Skywalker, that name no longer means anything to me. So yeah. that's what I think we'll be seeing. And also we'll be seeing Clone Wars era flashbacks. And how cool would it be see, to see a live action Ewan McGregor with a live action Hayden Christensen joined by a live action Ahsoka? Okay, for Clone oh. Wars flashbacks, that's gonna bring it all home, baby. To and that bring it all what, home, and that's and the and those stuff are my Star Wars dreams are made of. Yeah, those are my predictions for the show. Yeah, yeah, I think you're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, it would be a mistake not to have those moments. So. Um, who knows? I mean, I, I think that we could be seeing a, an Obi Wan Kenobi. That obviously he suffered a lot of trauma. What what effect is it having? I mean, what what demons is he trying to keep at bay? What visions might he be having? Um, we know flashbacks played a big part in uh, Boba Fett, Book of Boba Fett. We. I'm assuming that it's going to also play a big part in uh, in this series. I don't think he's going to need a back to tube or a back to tank or whatever it is uh, to do it. I think it's going to be I think when we see these flashbacks, I think it's going to be um, moments when we're going to see Obi-Wan very pensive, very uh, much, uh, you know, to himself. I don't want to say meditating, 
but I think lost. I think he's going to get lost in his own thoughts, his own memories, and his own fears. So that's that's my prediction. And and who knows? We may not see much literal Vader at all, though. We know we're going to get that uh, that rematch that they keep talking about. You know, unless it's a technicality. What if the rematch is just something in his own head? With all the hype they've done for this series, <laughs> revealing Vader is going to be in, in it from the very beginning. Uh, they better come through with something big. If it was just a Vader cameo that we that was left as a mystery, and we just saw it in a show, that would blow us away. And everyone would be so happy and yes. thrilled. But since they have publicized it so much and promoted it so much, anything less than full Vader is going to disappoint. And they have to know this. They have to know this. How much changed between the rewrites? Well, we know one thing that, uh, one big thing that changed, and that's this guy right here. Darth Maul was originally, according to reports, mm. we have on fairly good authority, but there is, <laughs> there is a story. Uh, what is this from, Jim? This is, I don't see the attribution here. Is this oh, from this Hollywood is, Reporter? Uh, from the Hollywood Reporter, yeah. Hollywood Reporter, the headline is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Darth Maul scenes cut Luke Skywalker replaced during creative overhaul. Mauled Ray Park, who originally, <laughs> I love that. Mm. Uh, Ray Park, who originated the character with The Phantom Menace, was expected to reprise as the character, but then was written out according to multiple sources. This is Hollywood Reporter, folks. This is not, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, run of the mill, uh, you know, nerd site. This is the big time. And, uh, we, you know, we knew, Jim, that there were rewrites. Uh, yeah. This goes back, what, uh, a, a year ago? A little bit more than a year ago, I think, when uh, we yeah, speculated here on the show. Does this. Early yeah, two years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. So the show was was uh, in pre-production and it came to a halt. And I remember getting kind of concerned. Like, does this mean that the show is not going to happen at all? Is that what this means? Um, but what seems to have happened is that, um, at least in this case, Darth Maul, who was originally going to be the uh, the big bad in the show, was uh, replaced by Darth Vader. And that was at, again, according to this source, um, at the behest of uh, Filoni and Favreau. They really yeah, challenged yeah. Deborah Chow to go big or go home on this. And, wh and, right. and why deal with, uh, you know, why have Darth Maul when you could have Darth Vader? Yes. Um, this, this does add up because we had heard this stuff and started reporting it last summer. So, uh, you know, those who uh, are keen listeners of Rebel Force Radio, this is old news for you guys. I do want to clear up something, though. A lot of people are thinking that the switch from Darth Maul to Darth Vader happened in early 2020 when the writer was replaced. Hosina Mini was the original writer, and he worked with Deborah Chow. And uh, Lucasfilm was unhappy with the scripts that he turned in. But that's not when Darth Vader was added in pre-production. This switch happened earlier, maybe by a year or so, maybe early 2019. Um, Filoni and Favreau, they were working on The Mandalorian and um, also Book of Boba Fett. And they have this lone wolf and cub story that runs through both series with the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda. That's your lone wolf and cub-like story. Kenobi was going to go on an adventure and protect Luke Skywalker. So Ben was going to take off with Luke somewhere. And they were going to be chased by Darth Maul. Mm. That got blown up before they even made the announcement about the Kenobi series at D23 in 2019. So it was earlier in the production, before they shifted the writers. In the case of the writer, that is what it all comes down to, is this lone wolf and cub story. They wanted to get away from that. They didn't want 
Darth Maul hunting down Ben. Vader, I think, may have still been in the story at this time. I'm not 100% sure. What I understand was that Darth Maul was removed and replaced by Darth Vader. But I think at one point, Vader and Maul were both included in this series. But then when the full rewrites happened, Maul was written out totally, and it became all about Darth Vader. That's how I see the timeline unfolding with the information I have been receiving for the last year and a half, along with this report from Hollywood Reporter. And another reason, another thing that backs that up is the fact that when Kathleen Kennedy announced the Kenobi series at D23 in 2019, two and a half years ago, she announced that Hayden Christensen was also going to be in the show. Right? Didn't she? Well, now or she did said that happen it, later? She, that happened later, but she did mm, say on that, that stage happen. about the rematch of the century. Right, right. So she made it clear that Darth Vader was going to be in the series. Right, right. And that was summer 2019. So I think that a lot of evolution has happened with this Obi-Wan story from the when it was originally going to be a feature film directed by Stephen Daltrey. And they started development on that back in 2014. So when Darth Maul was replaced or removed altogether, that it's hard to say exactly when that happened, but I'm thinking it's right around early 2019. Well, now, that's my guess based on the evidence I have in front of me. Now, Kathleen Kennedy said recently that she she actually talked about the the rewrites. And she said that she thought the original script, the original uh, scripts written by uh, Hossein Amini, were too bleak. Yeah. She said, uh, we're looking ultimately to make a hopeful, uplifting story. Yeah. And it's tricky when you're starting with a character in the state that Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, would be coming in off of Revenge of the Sith. That's a pretty bleak period of time. You can't just wave the magic wand with any writer and arrive at a story that necessarily reflects what you want to feel, what you want to feel. So after she saw that original script, um, she shut production down and then pushed the filming start date to August 2020 instead of January 2020. And that's when they hired uh, Joby Harold to take over the mm -hmm. new script. And, um, you know, he said, this was a character that's always been a minor obsession of mine. This is Joby Harold. When I heard about it, it was when I heard it was a character they were exploring. I very aggressively told them all the things I thought they should do. So it was bleak. Uh, perhaps it had. Now she's saying that she, let's see, they're trying to get a date here. Um, so it was, D23 on stage 2019. And summertime. Then, summertime, right. And then it was, she shut things, she moved production. It was, ah, it was supposed to start filming in August of 2020. And, or she moved it from, it was start, supposed to start filming in January 2020. Yeah. So they announced it in August, supposed to go in front of cameras in January. They move it to August. And yeah. uh, of course, then, of course, the whole pandemic, you know, erupted between that period of time, between January and August. So that pushed production back quite a bit. But so I think Probably you're gave right. Them the that, necessary that, time they need to fix the, the script and make right. it less bleak. And speak it, it's about this whole bleak script business. OK, Kathleen Kennedy told Gareth Edwards to make a war film. So he made a war film mm -hmm. and she said, oh, my God, this is too much of a war film. So they had to <laughs> fix all that, reshoot it with Tony Gilroy. Right. She told Lord and Miller to go out and make a comedy solo, make it a comedy. So they came back with hilarious stuff, wacky stuff. Imagine Ace Ventura flying the Millennium Falcon level wacky stuff. <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy said, this is too funny. This is too wacky. Bring in Ron Howard. Got to fix it. So something tells me Kathleen told Hossein Amini, listen, this is a dark time for the Jedi. They've been eliminated. The Empire has taken over the galaxy. It's a bleak, bleak story. <laughs> it's very bleak. So naturally, did I mention sack, it was bleak? <laughs> did I did I mention bleak? Can I can you throw in 
some bleak. <laughs> and so naturally the sad sack of Meanie comes back with the script and it's bleak as bleak can be. And she goes, oh my God, it's bleak. Well, yeah, it's bleak. Uh, you, you literally told me to write something who... bleak. And and so then all of a sudden she gets this idea that it needs to be hopeful. Down to the point, Jim, that some of the uh, you know the, the taglines that they're using in the trailer, I mean, it, it resolves on this idea of hope. So somehow we went from bleak to hope. And I think you're probably right. I think that it was a classic case of, you know, I set you on this course to deliver yep. something to me. And then I decide... I don't really want it anymore. Eh, right. I'm not really feeling right. like uh, it happens every time. Yeah. Feeling more like pizza tonight, not burgers. Yeah. And then the pizza shows up. Well, right. I want a burger. <laughs> 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 but uh, so uh, as far as this Hollywood reporter story goes, uh, there have been uh, people, uh, sources at uh, Lucasfilm that Hollywood reporter has approached and uh, none of them will go on the record, but uh, a source of theirs did deny this, which doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, come on. There's always somebody there to deny it. <laughs> there's right. always someone there to deny it. And uh, often I, I find at Lucasfilm, a lot of times the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So so-called Lucasfilm insiders could be just as much in the dark about things as we are here on the outside looking in because the level of secrecy that goes behind these productions extends internally to the studio itself. And I find that very interesting. So you can't take any denials. I, I do know this is that Lucasfilm hasn't come out with any public statement denying this report. Sources anonymously have uh, one source apparently uh, denied this. Also, another Lucasfilm source stated Ray Park was never on the set of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, that's not, I don't think anyone was alleging that, were they? No. <laughs> By that point, he'd been written out. Yeah. Um, Before they got him into makeup yeah. and on set. <laughs> Yeah, it's in in this they they say they have a source that says footage of Park may have been shot, although another source says it could have been test footage. Whatever the case, Park was back as Maul, or so he believed. Mm. And also, I re, re, I know at this time Ray was very active on Instagram, posting pictures of himself training, hardcore mm. training sessions in his garage. So, what was he training for? What was he promoting? This training was going to be all about. So, um, so it does add up to me. It really does. Uh, from rumors we've heard going back a year and a half to this, uh, Hollywood reporter story to Ray Park, uh, bragging about working out and stuff. And of course he, he did return to star Wars. They did shoot footage of him to match up with their animation in the seventh season of the clone wars. Right. So there could be some confusion about that, or is that a case of Clone Wars using Ray just because he was available, because he was there to uh, shoot test footage for Kenobi? I don't know, um, but uh, Ray Park will definitely not be in Kenobi, from what I understand. Yeah. All right, what do you say we go to the cantina? I am dying of thirst. <laughs> right, well, we got... <laughs> Uh, Rebel Force Radio exclusive coming up here for you. Daniel Logan, yes. young Boba Fett himself, uh, star of Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, as well as appearances in uh, The Clone Wars. Um, Got to check it out. Um, you imagine what he thought. Can you imagine what he thought watching the Book of Boba <laughs> Fett? Well, if you notice, he hasn't been out talking about Book of Boba Fett, but you know he's got opinions well, that's because he was saving them for us here at Rebel Force Radio. So uh, we're going to go into the cantina with our buddy Daniel Logan. Find out what he thought of the book of Boba Fett. Star Wars, Star Wars Cantina. Where are you going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. <laughs> Oh my God! Look hey. at that guy. This is... How you doing, buddy? I'm doing. How you guys doing? Oh, you're doing great. Look how good you look. Look at you. You got your hair cut. You look sharp. You're all groomed, man. You're you're so groomed. And you got Boba Fett standing there right behind you, standing guard, 
one fat Look looking out for another. I love it. He's always got my back, yeah. <laughs> even when I least expect it. Yeah, yeah. So you're coming at us uh, live from the Bounty Boxes uh, home headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. The home of the home of Bounty Boxes, created by the Bounty Hunter himself. Yeah. Has that been going well for you? Dude, it's been amazing. You know, um, over the last year and a half, two years, I've, um, I've created Bounty Boxes on Facebook, and we have almost uh, just shy of 9,000 members now. And uh, it went from being a group to basically a community and a community to being a family. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of my, my, uh, my community and my family. I, sh- I call Bounty Boxes. It's a very yeah. great group. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know a lot of people who look forward to your live videos and your auctions and uh, they have a lot of fun with that. And you're right. You have developed a community and that's, I mean, that's really something that motivates me and Swank to keep doing RFR is the community. And it's not like we ever thought of stopping it to, to begin with, but I mean, that, that really kind of puts fuel in the tank, you know? You know, one of the things that I love most about um, the Rebel Force Radio is that it, it reaches everybody. And everywhere in the world that I go, I actually get thanked for coming on to your guys' show. And uh, it's an honor for me to be your friends, let alone being able to come and talk Star Wars with you guys. And it's it, you don't even know what you guys created worldwide, and it's an incredible thing, guys. And I just want to give you guys the respect that you deserve. So thanks for having me back on. Well, that's really kind. Thanks, Daniel. That's, that's great to hear. And we do know that when uh, folks appear on the show, I mean, we they do – you know, reach out because I think they realize that, um, you know, we are a bit of a conduit, you know, to, uh, some of the personalities and some of the people that they've grown up with watching. And so many people, you know, as, as we look back at, you know, the, the Boba Fett series, we've looking forward to Obi-Wan. And as we get some of those prequel vibes, we, we, all of a sudden we realize that there's just this whole generation of kids that were kids. They're now adults and they grew up with you. Yeah. Amen. I mean, it's incredible, you know, um, growing up in the Star Wars world and also the convention world, um, it was very much, uh, as you said, it was uh, it was the original fans that came out to the conventions and, and supported and everything else like that. And the Jeremy Bullocks and, and the Dave Prowse and the uh, Kenny Bakers, their lines would be humongous. And because I was in the prequels, my fans weren't quite yet there to have had jobs <laughs> and making money. Um, so my line was always shorter and smaller, even though I, I do give respect to the original fans. But now it's unbelievable how many prequel uh, adults, I should say, not kids anymore, are coming to these conventions and they're literally coming and supporting me. I'm the childhood hero or uh, <laughs> they grew up with me and the, they love, you know, and it, it's it's come full circle. Now the prequels uh, have actually uh, risen uh, within the fan base and, and they're the people who are now doing the biggest supporting almost. Oh, they're, they're, they're now the new nostalgia. I mean, I think yeah. it, it crystal, cause I know you're a collector too, Daniel. Uh, it really kind of hit me when, uh, Hasbro put out those six inch figures with the vintage episode one packaging. I'm like, Holy cow. Episode one is now considered vintage. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, episode two is not far away, buddy. You're going to be vintage here before too long. Well, that's what I get. I keep saying to all my collector friends, I'm like, when are they going to bring me out on a VC? I mean, technically, I'm in a vintage collection. <laughs> but if you ask the original fan base from, you know, uh, A New Hope, Empire and Return of the Jedi, they're like, don't you ever call those vintage? You know what I mean? Because obviously oh. vintage is late, early 80s. Um, but I guess vintage comes to when it becomes 20, 25 years in the, in the Star Wars world, you can then become a part of the uh, vintage uh even though I do feel vintage now, being in it for so long, um, <laughs> there's, there's still a very big passion around the, the late 90s, early uh, 1980s Star Wars toys that used to just flood the whole entire uh, supermarket or the markets. And, and there was nothing else like watching the aisles of, of the original. We're, um, you know, we're not going to do the, We're not going to do this tonight, but sometime, Daniel, I want to have you back. And I want to go through all of the young Boba Fett action figures that have been released and get your take on those. Because, uh, oh, look at that. Jimmy Mack. <laughs> He's got one right here. <laughs> I got one. There he is. There he is. There's young Boba. This was released in 2002. And uh, he's got two blasters. Uh, we don't see him use a single blaster in the film. 
Um, but he does uh, shoot the ship blasters, which are pretty impressive. And he's wearing this uh, rain poncho and uh, looking pretty badass with his two guns there. I mean, you could see a young Clint Eastwood sort of uh, vibe with this. And also, he, uh, he came with the uh, helmet. Oh, look the at helmet. that. I see. I completely yeah. forgot Remember about Remember that? that. Oh, wait, I don't have it on straight. That it, that it was meant to fit. You know, <laughs> you right there. oh, he dropped two of his blasters. All right. Uh, yeah. But you can see, I, I even have the little rubber band holding the blaster on still fresh oh, out wow. of the packaging. Okay. All the you you know, know what? years later. You just ripped open a 20 year old figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. And I remember uh, ripping this open actually back in 2002. And, um, I <laughs> that chance. Oh, all right. That was my little... young, my young clone himself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my new thoughts of my life. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. It's all right. So Don't I, worry I thought about for it. sure, though, we would see Boba wearing the helmet. I was hoping he had like a little helmet and he and Django would go on adventures together and both be wearing the same helmet. Well, they, if you, you know, that's clone, canon to me. If you watch the Clone Wars, it was only meant to be that uh, young Boba actually ended up keeping his father's helmet. Then he tried mm -hmm. to do uh, some pretty cool stuff with Mace Window. I won't ruin it if people haven't seen the Clone Wars yet. Um, uh, and it's almost sacrifice. Look at look at what uh, Max got now. Here he's got he's got little student Boba with the with the little hat and uh, you know <laughs> that was a hot the electrodes. I'm not gonna lie, and I'm so glad that they gave me a figure because. Um, it was literally like, I want to say a 15 hour day of having to sit and stand in each one of those positions. So when you see the clones come to be and, uh, Obi-Wan's walking through that, um, corridor, mm -hmm. when they look down and they see young Boba Fett or, or the clones, I should say, um, I had to sit and stand in each one of those positions. I think it was over 70, 78 or something like that. Different seats. No and positions. kidding. Yeah. I think most people that watch that, Daniel, would have thought that was all done in CG and they just put your face over it. But you had to go in there and do all of those different, you know, because, you know, every, each kid is hitting different buttons and all that. Got That's it. crazy. And if, and if you look at it, they kept changing around the color of the headgear. So one guy would have red and uh, blue or whatever it was. And then they'd have to switch. So the next guy next to him didn't have the exact same color. And yeah, it was it was pretty incredible how George does his uh, movie magic. Amazing. Amazing. Let me ask you a question about Camino. Um, did you catch the Bad Batch animated series last year? Did you catch any I, of that? I did. Yes. I've been up to date with all of the cartoon series, um, all the animators, I should say. Um, yeah. yeah and I, yeah. I, I'm loving what Dave Filoni's uh, bringing to the world. I mean, who would have ever thought of being able to expand on an already expanded character like Boba Fett and Jango Fett, uh, being able to bring technically family members of Django and Boba to life and then give them all different personalities was, uh, was a wonderful idea. And, uh, I think a lot of people have attached to the, uh, the series, the bad batch, and we're all waiting for the next uh, season to come out. So as we speak about this, uh, this little, uh, clone student that you played, uh, 70 times in episode two, that was all that classroom was on the planet Camino there at that, uh, uh, Topoka City, which got destroyed in the Bad Batch. And I was just wondering if there was any sort of emotional response from you when you saw that happen. Y you mean uh, bad blood? Yes. You know, uh, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Being attached to Camino, um, it was my home planet. Um, and it, it was a very sad thing to see how um, it, was be it was able to be destroyed. But then I was also very sad to see that my babysitter, uh, Ton Wee, was actually also killed. Uh, <laughs> right. Wow. So, I mean, people don't realize, but Boba Fett had a lot of sentimental um, love for not only Camino, but all the Caminoans, I guess, as they call them, um, like Ton Wee, that uh, mm. would have been responsible for raising Boba when Jango was doing all of his bounties at nighttime. Right. Remember, um, Dad, Ton Wee's here. Remember that? That was great. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I never forgot every dream. It's the best thing to be able to answer back people with a three letter word. Y E P. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> yep, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Boba, is your father here? Yep. <laughs> Dad, <turn> Weezy out. <laughs> no, I love that. God, I see him. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just love that. All right, now we're already getting too silly. Um, the reason we have you here, Daniel, is primarily for the fact that a lot of people have been wanting to hear your thoughts, uh, your your review of the season of the Book of Boba Fett. So I just want to ask you, uh, what were your favorite moments from the series? Actually, to start off, this is the first time I've actually spoken publicly about my uh, my thoughts on the book of Boba Fett. I yeah. um, I haven't really been doing very many interviews. I was doing them a lot when I was young, but then um, the way I'd answer questions and stuff was kind of off script, and I kind of realized and was like, maybe I shouldn't do as many interviews. So uh, I'm very honored to be able to talk about the book of Boba Fett first time with you guys. Oops. Um, We're honored guys. to have you. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really, I really liked it. I mean, you know, you, you got to remember that for so long, there was fans that wanted to see Boba Fett come back, that he survived the Sarlacc pit, what had happened. And for a lot of those fans, it got to fill in the gaps of, um, and, and bring some of those stories to life that we'd been waiting for, for quite a long time. Um, uh, it, it's, it's also great. The fact that, um, they were able to bring back some of Boba Fett's history. Um, and as we said, Camino, Geonosis, mm -hmm. um, within the flashbacks. And those were awesome, awesome scenes to be able to not only continue the story going forward as kind of George Lucas did and then gone back, but being able to go back during the process of moving forward, um, and being able to see Camino again, as the, we said, the prequel lovers, and as of course myself, I was just so excited and so ecstatic to be able to see, um, my home planet again also see um the slave one and um or, or the boba fett starship um <laughs> sure <laughs> whatever it is they're calling it these days <laughs> exactly but uh one of the fun things was me for, for me was um it got to give us another wonderful fun quote like you know like a bantha you know so <laughs> yeah I think the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, Star Wars community went nuts over that, and so did I. Yeah. We all thought it was an awesome uh, little quote that we'll be able to uh, enjoy for very many moon moons to come. Oh, it's great, man. So memeable, you know. And that's what, when Star Wars is hitting on all cylinders. I hear a lot of young fans say they love all the prequel memes that really speaks to them. And it's a lot of fun. And uh, so I think that's something that really has, has kept the prequel up in everyone's attention. You know, it, it's been up in everyone's face all this time. You, you can't log on to the Internet without seeing some sort of prequel meme. And now, <laughs> like a bantha has become, in, you know, in that tradition, like a bantha, definitely. Like a bantha. <laughs> True. Yeah, exactly. Daniel, as you look back at the whole uh, Boba Fett series, I mean, were there uh, any surprises? I mean, you're a guy that is... <sighs> knows quite a bit about the character. You've played the character, you collect the character, you're surrounded by, by fans of the character. Um, were there any things that came out uh, that we learned about Boba Fett that even surprised you? Uh, I, I was surprised of how much he had his helmet off, you know, and mm. uh, being a huge Boba Fett fan. And, you know, I could say as, I guess being a Boba Fett, um, it would have been nice to be able to, um, see le less of his face and more of his action. Um, so I was very surprised that uh, they went with the directive um, aspect they did with, with having him with his helmet off so much within the series. Um, I was also surprised that we went back to Geonosis. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, mm. as the prequels, one of the most impactful moments was when Django got his head chopped off by Mace Windu. And um, I, I think the... Uh, the whole Geonosis aspect and bringing him back was uh, uh bringing the world back was uh, was pretty shocking because I just thought that I did those scenes you know 20 years ago and um all of a sudden I'm I'm back in the arena like it was 20 years ago and uh, picking up the helmet again and bringing back all those memories wow and were you surprised by that did, did it shock you to see uh those those shots being incorporated into the series it, it did. I mean, uh, I wasn't told anything about it, 
Um, mm -hmm. They literally called uh, Lucasfilm called me up a couple of days before the uh, the episode, maybe a week before the episode was released, and they said, "Hey, we're gonna have you in one of the flashbacks." And I was thinking, "Well, how, how am I gonna come back in a flashback?" Um, and then when I watched it, just like everyone else, that's the kind of cool thing about Star Wars. I was able to see uh, they brought back the iconic scene, and and for me, um, I love it. They are missing the uh, the reek, um, as a lot of fans have, have um, pointed out. Oh, but, yeah. But it's one of those simple things that you you just forget, but the prequel fans never ever forgot. <laughs> uh, especially, especially with my my father was the one who killed it. So um, yeah, it, it, that was a big shocker for me, and and a really awesome surprise. That, those were alternate takes, weren't they? Those weren't so, the, the final takes we see. I, I something seemed different about when you ran up to the helmet and picked it up. So some of it was um, shots that we had filmed uh, back uh, in Australia. So they used some of those shots that they didn't air during the uh, episode, obviously because it was just one of those quick flash shot moments. Um, but I didn't realize George had actually captured when I was running up to the helmet, and then also um, the pickup, but. The over-the-shoulder shot, I believe um, they brought in a, um, a body double for that. And then mm -hmm. also when uh, I jump out of the bed in Camino, I don't ever remember there being a bed because I would have been laying in it all the time. Um, so <laughs> they then refilming that shot, and then they deep faked uh, my face. Yeah, so that over-the-shoulder shot, that was um, the other little kid. I, I forget his name. Um, and then uh, there's another shot which is when I jump off the bed and then run to the window. Um, that's also the, the, uh, the other little boy. Um, cause I, yeah, like I said, I, I never jumped off any bed. It would never have got me out of it. <laughs> yeah, we never saw any bed. So you're saying that that was, was that shot new for the series or was that like a, an, an outtake from uh, episode two? It was a mix of both. Some was mm. outtakes from episode two and then they had to mm. come in and fill in the rest. Um, uh, and then they, they deep faced my, my face uh, that as mm -hmm. that was the, uh, where they came back and they did the deep face or something like that, whatever they call it. Um, which was pretty awesome to be able to catch my little face like that. And, oh, and, you look uh, so sad watching dad mm -hmm. run off and have adventures without you. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, it does add some additional layers to your character or, or that, that oh state of your character, you know, uh, 20 some years ago now. So we get a different perspective on Boba. It wasn't all just, you know, following dad on all these different adventures that there was a sense of, uh, you know, perhaps abandonment and, you know, all those things that kids in real life sometimes face. It, it, like I said, I, I can only imagine that Tonwi was my babysitter. Cause I mean, <laughs> if, if we were on earth, you'd have uh, child services calling, you know, saying who's looking after the kid while his dad's going and killing guys. <laughs> so um, that's why I can only put my own spin on it and say Tanui was my original babysitter. But um, <laughs> the, 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 the look was incredible, you know, and I think that they captured it perfectly. And um, it's kind of one of those looks where you leave your dog at home, you know, and you open the door because you forget your keys and they're just looking at you like, <laughs> big puppy dog yeah. eyes yeah yeah but then always excited to see you when you come home you know and that was that was boba and Django's relationship yeah yeah he might have been mad when he left but he was so happy to we're see gonna, him come back we're gonna end up creating a whole new expanded universe just on this conversation oh we do it every week on the show believe me <laughs> we're our own canon <laughs> <laughs> well i have to say daniel um it was a thrill to see your name in the credits in that those couple episodes when young Boba Fett showed up, he said, like, "Young Boba Fett, Daniel Logan." I love that. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, it was an honor. You know, um, for me being so young, I didn't realize the power of Star Wars and the reach and what the fan base was like. And um, you know, they've they've continuously continuously kept bringing me back, and uh, I've been so so grateful to it. Yeah, you see the reek over there on the left. As a, oh, as a Star Wars yeah. fan, we're looking at a movie. we're looking at a at a at a, a graphic where you've got the, the original shot of Daniel holding the uh, the Jango Fett helmet in Attack of the Clones, and underneath is from Book of Boba Fett. And yeah, I mean, for some of us, it looks like the same thing. But as Daniel pointed out, yeah, there's a re the, the remains of the reek uh, in Attack of the Clones. It's not there in Book of Boba. Fett. You still have the battle droids scattered throughout, but uh, not the reek. 
I do believe that was uh, the outtakes um, of episode two for that one. And then as yeah. you go over the folder, you, you end up um, kind of being able to see just a tad because they did great um, uh, auditioning that it was the uh, the other young little uh, young man. And then uh, obviously the Camino scene uh, when I was in the house. But uh, I still remember that like it was yesterday. You know, I mean, I remember when George Lucas, I said, well, George, what's going on around me? Because I just had dirt and blue screen, uh, green screen around me. And go, mm -hmm. Well, I know you, you're going to have these droids and they've been uh, killed and some of them are blowing up and there's smoke rising to the sky. And, uh, and I'm just sitting there just looking, imagining all these things, you know, and, he just looked at me like, no, no, no. I just need you to pick up a helmet and stick it to your head. And I'm like, oh. okay. <laughs> the theater of the mind was just too much distracting, even for a professional actor on the set like yourself. But I, I brought this up to you in the past. That, that image of you holding that helmet, it, it's probably my favorite moment of yours in the entire film. I, I, there's just something so striking about that visual and you, you feel the pain, you feel the pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you know, it really, it really literally gives that legacy to Boba Fett that this is why he became who he became. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why he kind of had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder towards some or all Jedi. Um, and then became the badass bounty hunter that we know he, as him as today, you know? So um, I think it was a, the perfect, you know, beginning to, to his legacy. Yeah. And it, 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 it definitely ties into book of Boba Fett and his, well, his evolution in that series, because you can imagine that, you know, suffering that kind of loss, this is the one person that you trusted. This is the one person that was always there for you. And then, then they're gone. And you can imagine a young person saying, okay, that's it. I'm done trusting people. I'm done, you know, bringing people in. So you have a very solitary Boba Fett, formed by that moment and then we see in the book of boba fett how he starts to adopt some new things like you know having a tribe realizing he he really can't get along without others in his life yeah and exploring the bounty hunter world you know i mean uh in the clone wars we got to take on you know other character relationships you know and uh so much more that we were meant to explore um but obviously we, we still haven't been able to see him or may never ever get to see those episodes. Mm, so Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing. Despite the fact that there was so much about Boba and his history revealed in the book of Boba Fett, to me, there's still a big wide gap of character development that is missing from Boba's story. The mystery years, the adventures of young Boba Fett after the Clone Wars. <laughs> I love and, you, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, because you know what I'm thinking. Disney <laughs> Plus needs a new streaming series. Boba Fett was so popular. How about the adventures of young Boba Fett? How about starring Daniel Logan so we could see your name in the credits every week? That would be amazing. <laughs> I, I'm just uh, saying, I, I know you, I don't have to ask you if that's something you'd want to do. I know you'd, you'd love to because you're... You're so so connected with Star Wars. You are a f like the fan ambassador, in my opinion. Out of every actor who's ever been on screen, I don't think anyone has given back so much to the fan community and has made such a connection with the fan base. So it only seems natural to have Daniel Logan star in The Adventures of Young Boba Fett. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Um yeah. You know, it, it's uh, it's just one of those things. You never know where they'll take the storyline next. You know, um, mm -hmm. George Lucas went backwards after three episodes, you know, which right. kind of I would have seen him do the next three after, but I would never have been in them if he did continue moving forward. So I'm glad he did come back. Yeah. Um, but that that's the world of Star Wars. And, um, you know, I, I think for, for me, uh, as you know, an opinion, I, I would really have liked to see um, them bring some of the Clone Wars episodes back to life and then yeah. follow some of those flashbacks as well. So bringing some of the younger Boba Fett back into the uh, theatrical world and then seeing some of the things that had happened in his life leading up to the Sarlacc pit or even leading up to Empire Strikes Back or yeah. right after Empire Strikes Back um, and, and be able to explore more of that. But you never know, you know, with Season two, there's always a possibility if, if they carry Ooh. on the, the Book of Boba Fett series. Ooh, yeah. 
Yeah. So, of course, the season two has not been announced yet, but uh, and I, I, know I, I love the direction this conversation is going in. And um, I definitely think it would be essential to the character's story to fill it in, fill in the blanks with some of the years, you know. Boba in his 30s. We have Boba in his late 50s. Let's see what he was doing in his 30s. And <laughs> oh, too. look at that. Oh, he's flexing. It's a gun show tonight. <laughs> as long as I've known Daniel Logan, he's kept himself in impeccable physical shape, and he's ready to don the armor at any given moment. So uh, what what might be a pipe dream today could turn into reality any, any day now with the expansion of Star Wars on TV and everything, and Sooner or later, they got to start making movies again. So uh, we, we know where to find you if we need you. <laughs> yeah, just call Jimmy Mac. He knows how to reach me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll represent you. I will. Okay. And and I am hard but fair at negotiating. So, so you could be uh, my I, next I'll, party I got you covered. if I come back. <laughs> I'll be your party. I, I, what your corpse? I be, no, 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 no. See, that's not nice. That's not nice. But I mean, I do have, I do have a firm grasp of reality, and I think I would be better as a body double for Tim Morrison than Daniel. Logan. I think I'm a little closer to that range. So uh, you know, let's be real about this. Uh, <laughs> You'll be spending more like time in the back of the tank. <laughs> Yeah, soaking my bones. Don't you know it? Well, if let me ask you, Daniel, if there was a season two, um, what would you what would you like to see in season two? What what did they leave on the table for you, at least as far as as this series is concerned? I would like to see Boba Fett leave Tatooine. I mean, don't get me wrong, yeah. I, I didn't mind Tatooine, but with the George Lucas series, he gave us so many different planets, so many different mm. visual effects to be able to take you to these places, um, you know, and maybe revisit Geonosis, you know, as uh, you go back sometimes to the place where you've had your hardest uh, or most harsh memory mm -hmm. and be able to use that in order to be able to move forward and, and kind of use it as a rehab to, to continue onwards. Um, I, I would have loved to see um, maybe, you know, uh, more battling with, Boba Fett himself. Um, I thought at some points they could have, um, you know, used more of the armor because there's so many different things with Boba Fett. Oh, all the armor. gadgets. He's like Batman, you know, in yeah. Star Wars. And, uh, you know, the one of the times where he was circled, I think at that point it would have been really nice for him to have his helmet on and then just basically fly up with his jetpack, use his flamethrower, flamethrower the circle, and then use, you know, his, uh, I forget what the missiles are called, and I just had a blank, you know, and heard them all going, pew, 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 <laughs> boom, boom, you know, and hold them all up in one second and being like, well, now you know um, who the new man on the throne is, you know? And yeah. I half expected, you know, you bring up that sequence where he's surrounded and, you know, why doesn't he use the jetpack? I half, you know, expected uh, to him to have kind of that sort of that moment like in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark when Indy doesn't want to be bothered with the uh, the swordsman and he just shoots him. Yes. I just figured yes. he would just hit the jetpack and just fly off, you know, and everybody would just be looking around, you know, like what just happened here? Yeah. Um, there is one character, you know, Jim brought up uh, Bad Batch, and I just I want to put a character on the screen. Just get your thoughts about this, because there's a lot of speculation about um, for fans of the animated series about Omega and the potential connection with Boba. And we talk about, you know, the connection you have with young fans and how a lot of, you know, especially fans that were young during the prequels sort of kind of identified with your character. So there's another young character that is being kind of linked to you. I think it's more fan speculation than anything else, but would you like to see uh, some sort of uh, real connection between Boba Fett and Omega so you wouldn't be alone? The big universe, you'd have a, a sister? Well, sister. technically, she did announce that she was a sister of Boba Fett. Yes. Or uh, a clone of, of the original uh, The OG. So I guess... Yes, the OG. So I was an unaltered clone, and I forget what they called her as a gene, uh, a clone gene. Uh, but so technically, just me putting it together as a puzzle, I would say yes, uh, she would be my sister. And uh, 
I remember when uh, she first came out and people sent me all these messages saying, oh, they brought you back as a female. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you. They brought me you and, back. Uh, yeah. And me and Jeremy Bullock, um, we used to say, um, and, and bless Jeremy Bullock, we, we would say um, on our Q&As when they'd say, hey, if they bring Boba Fett back or if you would to come back, who do you want to play? And Jeremy would say, I want to play Mrs. Fett. And then I'd say, well, I want to play Mrs. Fett's daughter or I want to play Mrs. Fett as well. And uh, it's kind of funny now to have an Omega, um, which uh, it's pretty cool because like like Dave Filoni, he, he's such a passionate um, fan of the franchise as well. So to be able to, to create all these different off, uh, 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 offsprings of Django Fett, technically, mm. um, it, it's become a very fun thing to watch. And uh, for me, um, I, I feel as I hope one day Boba and Omega meet each other. Because if Boba Fett knew that his little sister was actually going through all the trials and tribulations that she was going through, he would have more protection towards her than the Bad Batch um, crew because he can relate as being that young child growing up in that world of the Caminoans. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It's an interesting take because there's some people that kind of share that and there's other people that think that a, a Boba would be maybe resentful or have no affection towards, you know, the other clones. You see it kind of differently, like that he would perhaps look at her as a sister. He might look mm. at some of his other fellow clones as brothers or, or something like that. Well, in the Clone Wars, there was a scene where I had to um, obviously shoot the other yeah, clone uh, uh, trooper. Mm -hmm. And so what basically happened was he was trying to stop me from me accomplishing my mission. And obviously mm -hmm. he was like, hey, we're brothers. And uh, I turned to him, I say, you are not my brother. And I shoot him. That's right. But the thing is, is that I think under with the helmet on, there is a relation. Um, especially when they look more like his father because he's resentful mm. of he lost his father and he's using that as no one will ever fill the gap of my father. But having a sister technique that looks just like him, almost in a twin, like um, a complete twin, um, you'd have more uh, identification, uh, you'd identify more with someone that looked just like you or was very close in, in, uh, in, in look, as you can see. I mean, uh, she smiles a lot more than I got to smile in Star Wars. No, you got a kind of a snarl a lot of times in Clone yeah, Wars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was my hungry look. They didn't feed me very much, so every time I got hungry, I just... <laughs> They did, you know, they really did capture, you know, I feel like, I don't know how you feel, but young you uh, yeah. really well, I thought, on the Clone Wars. And to have you in there, you know, as the voice and all of that, it just, that was one of the things that made... Uh, that series so special is any chance they had to get, you know, the original back and, and, and contribute, uh, they did. And that always made it, you know, just more authentic. I yeah. mean, I was so nervous with the first few episodes. Like I was so nervous. I didn't want to ruin the character. I didn't want to disappoint Dave Filoni or Lucasfilm. And, um, I knew it was a, it was a huge honor to be back as Boba Fett. But then as I started getting on and feeling more comfortable back in Boba Fett's shoes, I started becoming Boba Fett again. And um, hmm. we did like three or four episodes or maybe more um, that weren't released. And those were ones that I got to do with Corey Burton. And Corey Burton just helped me oh, hit those man. lines, hit those words that you were made, you know, just made it so much more powerful. So when I went in and recorded those lines, it was like I was Boba Fett again, but I would just... Uh, growing a little older. And um, yeah, it was very sad not to see those episodes being released. Um, mm. When I got the scripts, I remember um, I, I pretty much cried um, to <laughs> read oh. what they gave Boba Fett and how he was going to come to be the character he was and and, and how he, um, I don't know how much I can say. Uh, right. You, know. you got to be careful here. Yeah, but we saw those animatics, like, you know, and so yeah. those have been released officially. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because as I'll we can see what, here, was, yeah. was that? Oh, as, as we can see here, right, he goes from being partly getting himself a, 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 a belt, some pistols and stuff like that. And all of a sudden we jump to forward where he's fully armored and um, 
you know, it, there's some really cool stories there. But no dent in the helmet. No dent. Not, not at that <laughs> not point yet. in time. Uh, after we obviously get off the ground, there's a bit of a smoke to the helmet. And um, and, and it was really cool for me um, to be able to give something to this character that was before my time. Because although I was young Boba Fett, I never really had um, anything that my character had given to the original character. And we always wondered what had happened to the helmet, how he got his dent. And um, I always joked around that Jango Fett's head was so big. And he, when he walked into Slave One, he just kept banging it on the, uh, <laughs> banging it on the, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, what is it called? The uh, ramp yeah. um, door. But then, you know, Dave Filoni brought it back to, um, you know, he gave me that opportunity to be able to give um, even the iconic dent on the helmet uh, to some of my work that, I thought it was pretty cool, but we never got to see. Yeah, at the hands of Not this guy, uh, Cad Bane, who got his live action debut in the book of Boba Fett, and they brought Corey Burton in. And you mentioned Corey, and any chance we get it uh, here on Rebel Force Radio, uh, we've never had him on the show, but any chance we get to uh, uh, talk about Corey, we we love what a what a legend and that voice. I mean, you just could not do that character without that voice. And so cool that he kind of took you under his wing there in the in the studio and helped you get through. Uh, you know, get get some of the the butterflies out. Yeah, I mean. Um... He, he, he's such a wonderful man and I have nothing but great things to say about him. And, uh, the, 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 the sad part is, is that not everybody's so outgoing as Jack, Daniel Logan. And, uh, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> I this is true. I, I could talk to five people at once, you know, and I kind of enjoy it. It helps to, you know, tie my brain out where, um, people like Corey is so talented and, uh, mm-hmm. You know, he he um, he he uses his, his time his downtime to create and be able mm. to merge himself into these characters that he has to uh, portray. And as you see with Cad Bane, I mean, watching him, you know, um, say those lines and be able to become Cad Bane, it, it gave me something even more to be able to feed off than you know I was used to it theatrically or some of the actors I've worked yeah. alongside you know, who, who are moving in front of me. Well, you've worked with so many talented people. I mean, super talents. Corey Burton, just one of them. Another one would be Ewan McGregor. And uh, we got to see Ewan a couple weeks ago making his debut as Obi-Wan Kenobi in the streaming series. And uh, how cool was that for you to uh, see Ewan back in that wardrobe and with the mullet and just like how you <laughs> left him on Camino? Just how he left Camino. Uh, no, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I'm... I'm the biggest Ewan McGregor fan. I mean, he treated me so well on the set of episode two. I mean, um, it, he almost became very childlike just to be able to match my uh, personality at the time. And uh, I will never, never, ever forget some of the memories that he's installed in me for the rest of my life. Um, if I got a quick moment, like, um, I don't know if I told it here on Rebel Force, but um, I was allowed to drive the golf co- uh, carts all around the set. So mm. he um, he would anytime find me, but come on, kid, let's let's go and drive the cart. So we would mm-hmm. go and drive together all over the studio. And there was this little hump between the two studios that we were working between. And he uh, he helped me to um, make it go faster um, by adjusting the little bolt that used to be behind the throttle. And uh, he comes flying down the, the studio uh, driveway. And uh, right in front of the first and second AD's offices, he slams on the brake and hits the thing sideways and goes. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you know, doing a pretty cool skid. And as a little kid, I'd never ever drove before. So this was the coolest thing that I was going to ever get to try. So he's like, all right, kid, come on. It's your turn. You jump in. He starts jumping out. And as he starts jumping out, someone from the studio comes running in and uh, cuts us off. It's like, get that kid out of that cart. And um <laughs> I didn't realize that there was something called a liability in lawsuits. Yeah, insurance, right? <laughs> yeah, insurance. You know, we didn't have the insurance to kill young Boba Fett. So uh, <laughs> they uh, they wouldn't let me drive the golf cart anymore. So I kind of pout. was like, oh, you and you ruined it for me. Oh, man, this hmm. and that. And um, which he really didn't. And then uh, <laughs> on my very last day of filming, uh, he comes up to me and uh, he asks, hey, Daniel, what time are you going back to New Zealand tomorrow? And uh, I reply, I'm going back at like nine o'clock or something like that in the morning. And uh, he says, all right, perfect. I'm going to tell your driver 
uh, to come and pick you up about five o'clock. You come to the studio. I got a surprise for you. And I'm like, oh, what? Oh, sure. Okay. It's me and my mom. We get up super early, five o'clock, maybe four or five. And um, we drive out to the studio when it's pitch black, can't see anything. And uh, I had no clue what, what I was about to do. And um, we drive into the Fox studio um, right where the gate is. And he's sitting in front of the gate with the lights on to the golf cart in, yeah. uh, in a row. <laughs> and uh, he said, come on, let's, let's go and drive around the studio. So young Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi drive the set of uh, the studio lot of Fox Love Studios it. for about an hour. Oh and, my I mean, gosh. That, that's just one of the things that um, is, is what kind of person he is. I mean, with yeah. such an established career and being such a, a huge actor, he didn't have to make that memory for me. And um, I'll never forget that, you know, that's one of the things that you have the power of being able to do no matter who you are or what you become is always giving back to those um that may need it at the time that you can give it and um i'll never forget driving around the studio because obviously my contract was up um right i was no longer uh <laughs> exactly so <laughs> there, I, there i was driving you know the golf cart and sitting next to him and he just sat there like so but yeah it was, it was awesome is it safe to assume then you're going to be like the rest of us on May 25th, uh, glued to your uh, your iPad, your smart TV, your phone, whatever you got Disney Plus on to watch that premiere episode of Obi Wan Kenobi? Yes, I went and bought a little bit bigger of a TV just for the Boba Fett uh, series. <laughs> oh, really? Hey, some people yeah. do it for the Super Bowl. You did it for Book of Boba Fett. All right. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, you know, I figured I got to see it in the largest form that I can. And, yeah, uh, good for I'm you. Really to it especially the fact that um they're bringing john williams back you know to do some of the uh oh, the yes. music and the um i love john williams and i think he's just a very very talented man um but yeah i'm i'm really <laughs> hey, get out of here <laughs> oh we got we got invasion oh, now toddler here. mayhem now look I, just I, so I, we're clear here we why, have an open I, door policy I, on I, kids I, but i also I, know that there's a privacy issue and you don't always want their faces on, on screen. So, but I don't want you to, you know, I would have put them them on, but there's a bathroom right next to my office here. I don't know why my wife is in that bathroom right now. So you ran in half naked and. uh, Oh, 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 all right. We have an open door policy for that too, Daniel, just so you know, we're, we don't (laughs) discriminate. (laughs) Welcome. Yeah. I wouldn't want yeah. the world to see that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, Daniel, you've been Come you've been great to hang with us uh, th- for this long. I mean, gosh, we've kept you a lot longer than I thought we would. Oh, oh there but, we oh, go, hey, buddy. There he is. Hey, little man. Hey, little man. What do you got? What's on your t-shirt there? <laughs> What's on that t-shirt? Iron is that Iron, Iron Man? Man? All right. Yeah. Oh, Iron Man. <laughs> well, he's, he's the next actor to come in the family. Hey, no doubt. Dad, Dad Conway's here. <laughs> come on. Daddy's come on. Dad. Say, Dad, Conway's here. Daddy's here. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> That's awesome. Who's this? Who's that over there in the corner? Oh, wow. Yeah. Say hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hello, little buddy. What's your name? Hey, Logan. Hey, Logan. <laughs> Logan, <laughs> Logan. Then Jimmy and Jason. You'll get to meet them probably in a couple of weeks. There's a moon on yours. There is a moon on his. That's that's actually uh, a sp- space planet from Star Wars. You, yeah. You'll be in a space planet maybe one day. If they need a baby Boba Fett. Uh, you can tell oh, this kid definitely right there. Oh, yeah. baby Boba. It'd be perfect. Be perfect. Exactly. Right, my baby? <laughs> All right. I don't, you want to get yeah. going now so Daddy can finish his interview? Yeah, let's go. Say goodbye to his friends. Okay, go eat your corn. Say bye, friends. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, he said, he said bye. corn, not <laughs> corn. <laughs> yeah, corn. I I, I know. Yeah. I heard the hard yeah, yeah, yeah. the hard C. Um, now, my family. Oh, my goodness. They're making me sweat. It's like oh, the it, guy with the interview oh, and, it's, and the kid's up and he's like... Yeah. Hey, hey, pushing the kid aside, and then the mom runs in and she's crawling along the bed and she starts yanking the kid out. <laughs> well, now, 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 how old, how old is he? He is four, he just turned four. Uh, four. Every okay, day. Wow. Yeah. and and it, it, it does he make the connection when you, sh- when you show, uh, you know, 
yourself in the it's, it's still not still not quite yeah. old enough to make that connection or does he no he does um yeah I but that's dad and he goes i said who is this and he's like boba fett just like he was able yeah. my wife was pointing at the screen at right. uh boba behind me and he was like she was like who is that who is that as you could hear her and um he, he knows who boba fett is and uh it's kind of crazy i haven't really pushed them up, uh, upon him but i think the no. fact that i had just so much boba fett in my house uh yeah. he has no but to know who Boba Fett is, and uh, yeah, he he's a he's a huge uh, daddy fan. So yeah, um, yeah. In sense, I can sit him down and watch episode two or the Clone Wars with him. Like, look, wait, wait, Daddy Singh's coming up. Daddy Singh coming up. And then his ADHD <laughs> kicks it and he runs away. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he's probably more familiar with Boba Fett than he is Santa Claus. Exactly, exactly. He still yeah. believes in Santa Claus. Santa Claus still brings him here. Uh, Santa Claus still brings him his his presents every year. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they get here, but uh, someone wonderful brings them. And uh, no kidding. Yeah, a clone of yours, uh, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Santa yes. clone. Yeah. Santa clone. Maybe Omega. <laughs> maybe Omega. Maybe Omega brings them for it. Omega. <laughs> now, of course, the fans have jumped all over Omega, and they've been putting your face on on her head, and uh, that's always very entertaining. Oh, to try to get the live action equivalent. Yes. Well, what do yeah, we well, have to draw from? <laughs> This this guy right there. I mean, th there it is. There's Omega, <laughs> facial hair and all. <laughs> Give him a wig. Oh my God. Well, like I said, Daniel, we've kept you on for a long time, but we want to ask you some of the Yoda questions because we've yeah, never yeah. done that with you before. Oh, believe I'm it or not, Yoda questionnaire. You know, these are Star Wars questions uh, that may look very simple on the surface, but are actually very complex. Um, very deep. Some some of the answers you might be able to give us, and um, uh, these these questions were actually sent to us by Yoda himself via fax. You think he'd have an email address, but Boba uh, uh, Yoda, he's still using the fax machine on Dagobah. Yeah. So uh, I think Jason has the questions. You want to make do. this official? Oh, wait, yeah. Let's make it official right here. The Yoda questionnaire. That's right. The official theme song, courtesy of Richard Cheese. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Daniel, <laughs> what is your favorite Star Wars line. Your favorite line from Star Wars. Impressive. Most impressive. But you are Ooh. not a Jedi yet. Empire Strikes Back. Empire yes? Strikes Back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Classic uh, showdown between uh, Darth and Luke. And it was all pretty much kicked off. Uh, yeah, they, they had a little sparring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's when Luke sticks that hose and it shoots the uh, steam in Vader's mask. Yeah. And, uh, impressive. <laughs> yeah. Most impressive. <laughs> 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 All right. That's a good one. That's a great one. Yes. That's a great. And I don't right. think anyone's ever given us that mm -mm. as their favorite line. That's a first. I thought you were going to say, he's no good to be dead. But uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Oba, I'm like, what does that mean? You know what my favorite line is? Dad, Ton Wee's here. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you, Jimmy. All right. What's the next one? <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Next question. What is your least favorite line? In Star Wars, what, what what's that line that you ah? It just kind of it's a little cringy. Just, that's wizard. <laughs> ah, <laughs> the wizard, <laughs> wizard Annie. <laughs> uh, throwing kidster under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I, no one just said wizard. I think we've had the yippee. No. Yippee has made it, but Wizard has not. So, uh, so far. So, Wizard Annie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a little cringy, I guess. Uh, All right, how about this one? Uh, what Star Wars moment makes you smile? Um, When Leia wears her slave Leia outfit. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> another movie. first. Another first. <laughs> Though I suspect. I suspect if everyone were honest that took the uh, Yoda questionnaire, that that would be a more popular answer. But you're the only one that has the 
Well, we'll just say guts uh, to admit that. that <laughs> well, well, see, most people think of a funny moment when they answer that question. Daniel, you, your response is more of that of appreciation. It's a smile yes. of yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm smiling for every young Star Wars fan out in the world. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, a, a lot of us who did grow up with Star Wars in the 70s and 80s uh, reached maturity uh, by seeing uh, th those images of Carrie Fisher back then. She was just so yeah. fabulous looking in that. And I, I, oh. I know she's gone on to say she didn't really care for wearing that thing. Of course not. It looks incredible. Incredibly uncomfortable, but uh, I think she had fun with it, too. Yes. And uh, the iconic imagery uh, speaks for itself. Yeah. What's that, Dan? Giving us the uh, the wonderful uh, costume that she wore very, very beautifully. Yeah, yeah. she sure did. She sure did. I mean, uh, she, you know, when, when I sometimes I'll see pictures of her, particularly some of the behind-the-scenes stuff at Empire Strikes Back, and she's just strikingly gorgeous. I mean, she's iconic for being Princess Leia, but she really is just a, uh, you know, was sadly just a uh, incredible uh, beauty. She's just absolutely beautiful on the inside and the outside. And, you know, Daniel, you, uh, you know, as, as a lot that, that do the convention circuit, you become a bit of a family. And I think you uh, had many, many times on the road with, uh, with Carrie Fisher. Yeah, she, uh, she had this lipstick one time, and uh, she signed my forehead. And at the time, I thought, well, what, whatever of it, you know. And then I ended up uh, smudging it across my forehead to try to wash it off in the bathroom, which technically any other fan would have probably just had it tattooed onto their forehead. Oh, um, totally. It, it left this huge red mark that made me look like I would rashed out from some weird, like, reaction. So for the whole, I think it might have been a celebration. For the whole celebration, I've got, like, this huge red sm smudge across my forehead. I'm like, <laughs> Oh. Courtesy of Carrie Fisher. <laughs> yeah, she was she, like you said, uh, Jay. She was um, her, her her personality was just as bright as as, as the beautiful character she brought to life. And uh, for everyone who got to meet her, they know how wonderful she was to meet and get sprayed full of glitter. And then everyone else who didn't, uh, you just got to take our word for it. She was the best uh, original character to meet. She just was so loving and and, and just adored what she had and what. She, what she can contribute to the world of Star Wars. Awesome. All right. Are you ready? We got a couple more for you. Um, this might be obvious, but you, who knows? You might surprise us. Who or what, because we want to be very inclusive here, is your favorite <laughs> Star Wars character? Who or what? Uh, my favorite character... He's going to say it. There it is. Okay. Yeah, it's it's totally we'll fine. give it to you. Yeah. Hold we'll give it to you. It's obvious. Like, he's the baddest character. Even if I didn't play him, I'd still think he was the baddest character and the coolest character in Star Wars. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of have to say. Now, now, who is your favorite babysitter in the Star Wars universe? <laughs> uh, well, Could it when, be? when Lamasu, Lamasu was technically always busy, so I'd have to say it was probably Tan Wee. Tan Wee's here! All right. Oh, <laughs> I forgot the days that Padme would come over and babysit me. Oh, ooh. <laughs> that's right. Or maybe one of the handmaidens. Well, yes. exactly. either way, right, you what's win, next, Jason. What do we got next? All right. <clears throat> Who or what is your least favorite Star Wars character? This is a tough one, I know, for a lot of people. But if you had to get rid of one, who might it be? I have a guess. Uh, I gotta be honest. I, I gotta say Finn. I mean, you know, Finn. Uh, Star Wars sequel was, trilogy. Finn. Run around and screamed, Ray! 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 <laughs> you know, and I only because I think that he could have been explored more. I mean, you yes, know, yeah. with the uh, with the fact that we brought out, you know, that he was a stormtrooper or. Um, you know, as I spoke about a clone being uh, uh, defected from, you know, uh, the clone and Camino, it was kind of the same that they could have portrayed with him as a stormtrooper. Mm. Uh, so I think, you know, they, they really missed out on being able to, um, you know, give him more in depth of a character. And um, yeah, yeah there was a lot more, you know, he, the character had a lot of promise and it just never quite 
took off. I, I, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah, and I, I think John Boyega would agree with that as well. So I, I feel like <laughs> speaking out about how uh, they, they dropped the ball on his character development for each film. So that's yeah, how he I sees think, it as well. Uh, all right, last question here, Daniel, and, and you're in a unique position because you've actually experienced this, but uh, let's just imagine that another Star Wars movie was to be made with you in it, and George Lucas is back as director. And what would you like to hear George say to you right after he says, cut on your last scene? See you next time, kid. Oh, nice. oh right. Very good. Perfect. Perfect. Very Great good. answer. Great. I can't believe you haven't done this before. But really? Well, that was fun. <laughs> that was fun. Hey, Daniel, before we let you go, uh, the, the last thing I want to ask you about is um, the Geeky Tiki's. Dominic Pace obviously played Gecko the Bounty Hunter in uh, The Mandalorian, and he's got these uh, tiki mugs coming out. And uh, I, I guess Bounty Boxes is involved with that, or you are directly? You know, I love Dominic, and um, like a like a, a character Boba Fett, you, you need to embrace your character as much as you can. And if you could do yes. more than what the presence of him on film was, um, which Dominic is definitely doing, um, I, I support that. And um, so basically he's teamed up with Bounty Boxes and um, uh, he and uh, the Tiki, Tiki Mug Company have created this really awesome Tiki Mug. Um, it don't, doesn't only have Gecko on it, it has uh, the Mandalorian, it has some of the, uh, the Reek, as you can see there. Um, and <laughs> the so Reek did make it. Cabinets. Exactly. Uh, IG-11 uh, right there on the front. So um I was very honored to uh, to join up with him. So, yeah, Bounty Box. This is one of the things that we do at Bounty Boxes. You know, we support other fellow uh, Star Warsians, I guess, uh, people who have <laughs> been in the franchise. Um, you know, from a split second in the world to people who have actually had, um, you know, very long careers in the in the universe. Um, we had Dominic Pace come out uh, almost a year ago, and um, he's a great person. He's a father like me, and. Uh, he was mm. um, supporting his children to hopefully get them into a, uh, you know, a, a good college so that they have every chance um, at success. So uh, we brought him out. I fell in love with the guy. His kids are awesome. And I figured, you know what, this is the kind of guy that I want to support. Um, but, you know, Bounty Box is one of those places where uh, we've had Ray Park, who was Darth Maul, to um, Ian McDermott, who was Palpatine. Mm -hmm all do signings for the, the page and or the group, I should say, and uh, or the family. Um, and it just keeps on expanding. Last week we had John Morton, um, who was, Dak. Uh, you got it. Jinx, personal yep. jinx. Um, <laughs> uh, Luke's, Luke's gunner, if most people don't know. And he got to tell us. So basically what, what we do is we bring some of the actors from the Star Wars universe. And, um, if you're in the group, you get to have a personal, um, story time from these actors of some stories that you may never ever heard because I'm the one who's asking all these wild questions. I think I froze again. Oh, I just no, you're back. We see you. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, Boba Fett does the freezing. Uh, he does not yeah. get frozen. That's what I know about that <laughs> <Exactly>. character. <laughs> and one of the coolest things was talking about the freezing was John Morton was actually the Boba Fett that was in the freezing chamber scene, um, oh. which a lot of people didn't know that there was many more Boba Fett's um out there in the world in jeremy because sometimes jeremy was doing theater or filming other projects so while he was away he um they had to have stand-ins come in and fill in those positions or also stuntmen um and one of the cool stories about dak which i didn't realize is that um in the inside of the uh, snow speeder what they did was george lucas actually had filled it with uh salt because obviously you can't have snow it would keep melting every single set mm -hmm. and the lights would obviously melt it so they had all the salt and then uh, at the end of it, they had to bag up all the salt, and then they sold it to another company that he ended up going on and working on that film and project that they used and reused the exact same salt. And my ADHD brain was kind of running away with me thinking, what, did you have a special connection with this salt? Did you know exactly each little, you know, uh, cut in the salt or whatever, or each shape that the salt was? How, like, how, how did you possibly <laughs> know it was the exact same salt? But uh, obviously it wasn't my time for q and I, I was the questionnaire and not the question answerer. So... Uh, I was just running that around in my brain, like, like, how did he know it was the exact same salt? 
He's a salt expert. Maybe he likes to salt his rim when he has a margarita from time to time. I know I certainly do. Maybe we well, we have, have the. Uh, I'm sorry, Dan. I said maybe he might have tasted the salt, and then on the next project, tasted the same salt, and no one ever tasted the exact same, same salt. <laughs> you see him putting it on his French fries. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, these uh, you, you got you guys all give so much back to the Star Wars fan community, and uh, the company is Beeline Creative, and they are uh, putting out these geeky tiki's uh, yep. for season one of The Mandalorian. And uh, Dominic Pace is going on tour this summer to promote it, and he's going to be all over the place. He's coming to Chicago. I'll be able to hang with him. And we have a little surprise for you, uh, Daniel. Dominic recorded a quick little message for you, and uh, we'd like to play it for you. This goes out to my dear friend, Daniel Logan. This is Dominic Pace, who played Gecko the Bounty Hunter from Season 1 of The Mandalorian. I'm not sure if the Star Wars community is aware of how kind and generous your heart is. In 25 years that I have been in this business, nobody has been as generous and as helpful as you are. To understand that to be in the same category of bounty hunters and to lift someone up when you didn't have to, I can't tell you how much that means to me and what that says in terms of your character as a human being and also as a member of the Star Wars community. You continue to inspire me every day, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have you on Gecko's first official licensed merchandise piece to sponsor it, as well as our second one coming this summer. You're an amazing human being, and I am honored to be your friend. Thank you so much, Daniel, and may the force be with you. There you go. Dominic Pace sending love to Daniel Logan across the galaxy. That, that, that definitely uh, touched my heart and my soul. Um, that's just what kind of wonderful man he is. You know, he's he's so grateful, um, and I, I love working with him. Also, actually, um, I'm hoping that we get the tiki mugs in time for celebration, and uh, I might have my own booth at celebration where I'm going to be able to sell oh. some of my stuff that I collected. And I'm oh. hoping that if we do uh, get the tiki mugs in time, it'll be one of the first places that you'll be able to actually live purchase the tiki mug. Um, most people don't might not know, but Dominic Pace is going to be at Celebration as well, uh, along with me. Um, and we uh, we're still working on some of the things that we're we're uh, developing. But um, yeah, if, if you guys are coming to Celebration, definitely look yes, up for Dominic. Um, obviously, official picks are running it now, and uh, I love the way that they run their conventions and, and their celebrations. So um, we're hoping to have him at the booth mm -hmm. where he's signing with all the other stars. Um, if not, he'll be at the Bounty Boxes booth, and we're hoping to have the Tiki mugs that you guys can get them there and possibly even signed live by Dominic Pace. So he uh, he's definitely a wonderful man, and uh, if you get the chance to go meet him, uh, I highly suggest you support him because, uh, like me, he really is just loves his character, and there's nothing wrong with that. Not yeah, at all. Great guy. Not at all. Great guy. I've been able to hang out with him in Chicago. Uh, went out to lunch with him last summer. He's just a really wonderful guy. And uh, we support the best people here on Rebel Force Radio. And you and Dominic definitely fill that category. You know. You know I don't have to tell you. I don't have to sit here. And, but I can't help myself because uh, love is in the air, Daniel. I had no clue. Thank you guys for that. That was a, that was a sweet message. That was a really, really sweet message. And um, Yeah, guys. Um, Watch out for his Tiki mug. It's, it's, like I said, one of the coolest Tiki mugs. Not only it's the uh, Gecko, but he's been able to incorporate so many other characters from The Mandalorian, especially with The Mandalorian uh, coming out later on in this year. You can't drink out of anything else besides the Gecko mug uh, or Tiki mug uh, while yeah. watching The Mandalorian. It just would not be the way. Not I'm going to get a whole set of them. I'm going to get a whole set of them. And, and I, I see spoken. myself drinking my ties out of that thing like crazy. So <laughs> that's going to be great. So I, I can't wait to see you in Anaheim in a couple yep. of months. And uh, we shall have a great time uh, just like we did tonight. Man, thank you so much for taking oh, wow. such such a great amount of t time out of your schedule to, to talk to us and give us your exclusive review of the Book of Boba Fett. <laughs> well, I hope people enjoy it. I mean, I can only say my feelings about it and uh obviously everybody has their own feelings and entitled to them and um I i'm just so grateful that boba fett is back you know and that's the coolest thing for me to be able to have you know push the character to as far as i could and it's kind of like a um, a baton being able to pass the baton over to uh tim Witter Morrison, and he's doing a wonderful job with the uh with the series so far so um yeah i pray there's a season two he wants mace windu back but he should have said i want daniel logan back 
That would have been pretty cool, you know. Um, I might have to chop his head off again for that one, but um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> but I, I thank you guys. I thank you for all that you guys do for the community. I'm so proud to uh, to support Rebel Force Radio. I've supported you guys since day one. I've loved you both um, for 20 or more years, and um, hmm. yeah, keep doing what you're doing because there's no other podcast like you guys uh, out there in the world. And I mean just like this one today it's just gotten better and better it's incredible what you guys are doing keep keep doing what you're doing the star wars community really truly appreciate it and thank you for bringing stories like mine to the people that uh, may never be able to meet us so thank we, you uh, buddy we're all geckos we're all just you know <laughs> trying to bring more of ourselves to the world that need more star wars so in positive ways as well yep no doubt just enjoy it. star wars that's our motto around here thank you so much daniel we love you brother Love you guys too. May See you next time, brother. You. See you guys. Bye bye. May the full speed with you. Later. <laughs> Later, guys. <laughs> See ya. There, he's gone. Daniel Logan. He's out of here. He's out Holy of here. Cow. Hey, how about that news he gave us? So he's going to be at Star Wars Celebration. But yes. I, I find it just amazing to get the news that official picks is returning. Yeah, to you were reading the my autograph mind. Autograph Pavilion. Tops I mean, is out of there. Great. Oh my God! <laughs> and and, and, and the, the, the you ask anybody who's attended the last few Star Wars celebrations, and they will tell you the autograph hall has been hands down, a mess. Yep. And so it's so good to hear the best in the business is back in action again. For sure. And uh, all those photos. Well, they, they practically, I mean, official oh picks practically God. invented, you know, yep. these big autograph halls at conventions. Uh, they, if they didn't invent it, they certainly streamlined it, made it so efficient, mm -hmm. and gave it an atmosphere that uh, has been sorely lacking over the last few years. That's for sure. Very exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Dad... Todd and Reese here. Rebel Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parody! <laughs> All right, Star Wars in pop culture for this week. Oh, we mentioned uh, those that glass from Kevin Lyle. Yeah, the beer glass. The Guinness beer glass. Uh, we promised a little bit more Guinness later on in the show. Oh, look at it pouring. Look at that. Got a little head on it there. It's great. Uh, we promised a little more Guinness in the show, and this is the point. We got the real deal. We got Alec Guinness from his memoir, A Positively Final Appearance. And this was, uh, I think he wrote a number of memoirs, but this was the last one. Mm -hmm. I think 1999. This was the third one he wrote. Yes. Yeah, a year before he passed away, this book was released. Um, I don't think it was a coincidence that his uh, final memoir was released the same year Star Wars made a big comeback in the theaters with <laughs> The Phantom Menace. I don't Certainly think that's not. a coincidence at all. But what I just found so great about this is it's a story we've heard before, but I don't ever recall hearing it come from Alec Guinness himself in his voice. We track down the audiobook for a positively final appearance. It's really not that readily available, which surprises me. And Alec is narrating it. He's reading it. And he tells this story of an encounter with a young Star Wars fan that is notorious, actually, among Star Wars fans who've heard this story. But have you ever actually heard it in Sir Alec Guinness's voice? Here it is. A refurbished Star Wars is on somewhere. I have no intention of revisiting any galaxy. I shrivel inside each time it's mentioned. Twenty years ago, when the film was first shown, it had a freshness, also a sense of moral good and fun. Then I began to be uneasy at the influence it might be having. The bad penny first dropped in San Francisco, when a sweet-faced boy of twelve told me proudly that he had seen Star Wars over a hundred times. His elegant mother nodded with approval. Looking into the boy's eyes, I thought I detected little star shells of madness beginning to form, and I guessed that one day <laughs> they would explode. I'd love you to do something for me, I said. Or anything, anything, the boy said rapturously. You won't like what I'm going to ask you to do. Anything, sir, anything. Well, do you think you could promise never to see Star Wars again? He burst into tears. 
His mother drew herself up to an immense height. What a dreadful thing to say to a child, she barked, and dragged the poor kid away. Maybe she was right, but I just hope the lad, now in his thirties, is not living in a fantasy world of second-hand childish banalities. A couple of weeks ago in a Chinese restaurant, the dapper little Chinese maitre d' bowed low as I left and, full of Chinese smiles, said, Sergin, now that Star Wars is being shown again, you will be famous once more. Oh, to be Ernest Thesiger. What? Who? I don't know. I, oh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, I Star That's star shells of madness in his eyes. That, I that, love that. <laughs> what would he think of us? Um, well, <laughs> maybe that boy was a young Jason Swank. I, I don't think so. I would have told you by now. Um, yeah, this has always made me a little uneasy, but you know... You got to consider the source. Look at look at the history of this guy. He he's been he'd been around for a long, long time. He'd he'd been in show business and entertainment uh, films forever. Star Wars was a little diversion in his career. I think it paid off very well for him. The oh, payday yeah. was big, but Huge. it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, bridge on the river Kwai to him or. Uh, any of his other, you know, big uh, iconic roles. It wasn't stagecraft. It wasn't theater. Right. I mean, look, there's a there's a bit of pretension, <laughs> obviously, in oh. Sir Alec. <laughs> oh, <laughs> as I much didn't as pick we up love any pretension. <laughs> are you? What are you talking about? He seemed like you know, both feet on the ground, man of the people, regular guy, regular guy. No, of course not. Of course, he made the poor kid cry. We with with the star shells of madness forming in his eyes. Now that that young man is now like in his mid fifties by this point. Oh, I man. wonder if he's like in an asylum or something, or he actually still has star shells of madness. <laughs> or and also, what what I'm wondering though is uh, how that affected him. Did was he able to maintain his Star Wars fandom after having Obi Wan Kenobi himself telling him to never watch Star Wars again? Did he ever watch Star Wars again? I have all these questions. Yeah, they say never meet your heroes. And, yeah, right. You know he. He did. Um, but, uh, you know, I, there is something to be said for if you waste your life, and you can waste your life with anything. You can actually waste your life in the pursuit of a career if you never, oh, if that's easily. if that's all you have. So yeah. this idea that, you know, it's only people that have passionate uh you know, uh, love for, uh, uh, you know, films or, or, or sports teams or whatever that, you know, we're the only ones that can fritter our lives away is, is crazy. There's, I see people all the time frittering their lives away. They wouldn't necessarily be classified as doing so by Sir Alec Guinness. Um, uh, of course not. But, uh, you know, it's just like you, Ernest Schlesinger. <laughs> oh, I wish I was him. Yeah. <laughs> so again, so again, you be famous again. <laughs> so the, the Chinese waiter. <laughs> oh, yeah, you'll be famous again. Oh, dreadful. Right. Dreadful. Oh, Kids those royalty checks coming Starship. by the truckload. of madness in their <laughs> eyes. Oh, oh, that money. Oh, I don't know how to spend it. <laughs> mm. No, he bought many of oh, man. that money, trust me. So oh, uh, that's uh, Sir Alec Guinness. <laughs> Always nice to hear from him on Rebel Force Radio, you know. Uh uh, he's always so enthusiastic about the wars. Say it loud, say it proud, <laughs> Sir Alec Guinness. Hashtag yes. just enjoy Star Wars, Sir Alec Guinness. <laughs> R.I.P. Star Shells of Madness. All right, we got a show called Dropout. Dropout was uh, recommended to us from Alexander. Great new show on Hulu. Dropout. Um, it featured a Star Wars reference in episode one. Now, this show is all about Elizabeth Holmes, an optimistic and determined young woman. I'm not reading this. Uh, an optimistic <laughs> and determined young woman who drops out of Stanford to find a promising new blood testing startup. 
So there's this uh, young student, Elizabeth, and she's at uh, the college campus of Stanford, and she's talking to uh, an instructor or a professor, what have you, played by Lori Metcalf from Chicago, uh, best known for Roseanne and the spinoff, The Connors. Oh, great actress. She's, yeah. she's, oh, she's right. the, the greatest, Lori Metcalf. And yeah. um, she plays the professor in this. So here's Elizabeth talking to Lori Metcalf, her professor, about uh, she pitches her the this idea to start this new business. And uh, here's the fallout from that. It's uh, nothing personal. You had an idea. It's not going to work. So you just you keep learning. Keep trying. I'm going to be heading home, and uh, very nice to meet you. Do or do not, there is no try. What? That's Yoda from Star Wars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Is that who so it she is? she leaves. <laughs> right. So Lori leaves, you know, and uh, Elizabeth chases her down. In the outside on campus and chases her down and still gets rejected. And uh, that's when Lori Metcalf has a comment to make about her Star Wars. Science is real. Yoda is a fictional green character who apparently knows everything in the universe except for syntax and grammar. (laughs) Oh, sick burn. Wow. (sighs) Taking down our beloved Jedi Master like that. Yeah. We all know that he he has faulty uh, uh, dictation skills. We know that. But you know why? You know why? Has has anybody ever thought about why? Why doesn't Baby Yoda ever talk? He's 50. He never talks. Why does Yoda have so much difficulty putting together a sentence? Why? Because his species is so evolved that it has grown beyond verbal communication and his species primarily communicates via the force itself. That's why Yoda has such problems with syntax and grammar and why sweet baby Yoda hasn't even said a single word up to this point. So I want to leave you this week on Rebel Force Radio with those thoughts about Yoda and sweet baby Yoda and why they have little to say. What? <laughs> you sounded like Lori Metcalf right there. <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. What? Oh, that's going to wrap things up for us this week on Rebel Force Radio. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be back. Great to be back. Just a reminder, if you want more Rebel Force Radio in your life, a great way to do that is through Patreon. Patreon is home to many exclusive podcasts from Rebel Force Radio that you won't find anywhere else. No, no, no. You got to go to rebelforceradio.com, click on that Patreon banner, and check out all the goodness. We already told you earlier on the show that Patreon supporters got early access to the Rebel Force Radio Rooftop Bash coming on May 25th, kicking off Star Wars Celebration in Anaheim. But in addition to that, you get these great new podcasts like RFR Comlink, the Q&A, the Babu Freaks, Clone Wars Declassified, Remastered, Filoni Files, and so much more. It's a great community of the best Star Wars fans in the galaxy. And all those details can be found at patreon.com slash rebelforceradio or go to rebelforceradio.com and look for the Patreon banner. A big thanks to our sponsors this week. Our friends at Me Undies and Indeed support them as they support us here at Rebel Force Radio. And don't forget about Rebel Force Radio on YouTube. It's free, costs you nothing, just the cost of a like and a subscribe. YouTube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. It really has been serving as, well, a virtual archive of Rebel Force Radio content over the years. Everything from classic interviews and parodies that you know and you've come to expect from Rebel Force Radio to uh, some of our other bits and the latest live stream after shows. We've got two seasons of The Mandalorian. We've got The Book of Boba Fett. We've got the first season of uh, The Bad Batch. All those live streams with your calls are still available over on YouTube. 
Plus, new full show audio drops each and every week. It's like a little premiere. You can have a little Rebel Force Radio podcast premiere party on YouTube. So like I say, like and subscribe today. We also love to hear from you. Show at rebelforceradio.com. That's the email address. The voicemail line, 708-320-1737. That's 708-320-1RFR. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. And we're on the web at rebelforceradio.com. But above all, if you want to support us here, the best thing you can do is subscribe to the podcast. Tell everyone you know about it. You got that Star Wars fan in the office or in the family, and they haven't heard of RFR, let them know. Tell them to check us out. We're available everywhere, streaming on Apple Podcasts, uh, iHeart, TuneIn, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, Audible, Pandora, Samsung, anywhere you can find podcasts, you'll find us right here at Rebel Force Radio, and you'll find us right here next week. We'll see you next time. For Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you always. Dad, Tony's here.